Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever according to the timeline. And uh, welcome, everyone. So as Chris has mentioned, probably I'll be having a presentation, not a long presentation. I'm not going to bore everyone with the long presentation. I have a short and crisp, around 10 slides. And uh, I have a two discussion questions at the end so that uh, I want to know the opinions from everyone. So what do they think? And if you have any clear experiences or if you want to share any stories, please be free. <clears throat> so Chris, can I share my presentation? Yes, please. Yeah. So just a sec. So is my presentation visible? Yes. If you can't see BJ's presentation, just go ahead and make a comment in the chat. I'm sorry, I didn't get you. I said I was just telling the group if we can't yeah. see your presentation okay. to let us know in the chat, but I think otherwise you're good. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So welcome everyone. So I will be speaking about the post harvest management to ensure food security. So and uh, critical role of capacity building in the post harvest management. So this is me, this is Vijay Yadav, and uh, presently I'm a president of the Post Harvest Education Foundation. So we do a lot of capacity building activities and uh, want to know more about our organization, you have a website over here. Please feel free to just quit in. So, okay, maybe I'll just start with this, uh, the routine topic in these days rather. So everybody is talking about the post harvest food losses and what exactly is happening. And I think in the past decade, a lot of noise was there in this post harvest and many organizations getting in and a lot of funding has been also be pumped into this post harvest management. So what exactly is this? So post harvest food losses, uh, now it is very much evident and it is significant in almost all the parts of the world. So there is no exception. Every part of the world does have a post harvest losses and it is happening at every stage of the supply chain. That's really a very big thing to be considered about and to be bothered about. So there's a small uh, picture over there at the bottom, so which shows uh, it's of course a representation, like every stage of your supply chain. So maybe it be packing or harvesting or during a sorting or transport, distribution, processing. So every stage in some or other way, because of a different reasons again, so you have a losses. So depending upon the produce again, sometimes the losses can be as high as 50 percentage. And in the worst cases, if depending upon the, like it's a perishable and the quite a sensitive produce, so the losses can also be up to 100% depending upon the produce. So what, do, what are we losing? Like why, why do we need to think about it? And why, what's the big deal about this food losses? What, when we are losing a food, it's not only the food which we are losing, but we're also losing all the resources which are spent. It may be a, a non-renewable resources or a human resources or whatever, even economic resources, whatever resources you might have spent. So to produce them, not only to produce them, to bring it all the way from the point of production to the point of consumption. So a lot of energy, a lot of money, a lot of resources are all being spent. And if there is a loss at any part of your supply chain, it means it's not only the food which is being lost, but also all the resources and all the work which was spent on that food is also being lost. So when we think in this way, it's really a very huge problem to be considered about. So, and these days there's a quite a number of organization, regional and international organization, they are quoting that. So when you're reducing the losses, it can be, a, it is a sustainable means to increase food availability and also to ensure the global food security. So how is that? So a lot of work has already been done to increase the production of the food. And it may be a grain crop, it may be fruit crops or whatever. And still, of course, there's still a lot of scope for increasing the production or productivity of the crops, but there are some of the grain crops where it is close to the saturation, like the, whatever can be done has already been done and there's a very minimum or little is, uh, there's a scope for the improvement in the production. So we are producing, it's good that we have improved our production, but if you are not protecting our produce after the production, so then whatever the thing which we have done again to produce, everything is going to go waste. So if we are able to protect that thing, like whatever thing is, which is, which is going waste of the production, which we are able, if we are able to protect that thing, so obviously we are going to increase the food availability and uh, it increases the chances of ensuring a global food security too. So 
so that's why i gave a title the post harvest uh, food loss reduction giving you a chance for the food security so when we have when we think about reducing these losses what's the first thing we need to know so why exactly these losses are happening so what is the reason reason behind these losses so again if we talk about it it's going to be again a huge discussion there is a long list of uh causes which are responsible for your food losses it may be again depending upon the product and a lot of things so making it easier or when we just check in the broader way so mainly lack of infrastructure so lack of infrastructure may be in the in the in the terms of a machinery or in the terms of a storage structure sorry it, it can be in any form so the lack of infrastructure and access to the uninterrupted cold chain so when we talk about the perishables especially so temperature management is the most important thing for reducing the losses and when we compare with all other ways to reduce the losses temperature management comes out with the most effective option to reduce the losses especially in the perishables so when you don't have a proper infrastructure or when you don't have an access to this uninterrupted cold chain so that is the one of the main reasons why we are having a food losses and uh, majority of the food losses do happen in the perishable food and in the perishable food so these are the main causes why we are having the losses so now we know the reasons so of course when we just figure out what are the reasons so next thing is we have to figure out how to reduce these losses once we know the reasons so we just need to stop those things so that we can reduce the losses so do we have a technologies do we have a work which has been done so fortunately we have a huge number of research programs already done and we have a number of literature published and whatever number of innovations and uh, a lot of innovations are still happening a small scale and large scale or whatever we have a good number of technology already available so the only point is how do we use this technology so that comes the point so the next comes the thing so how do we reduce the losses when we list out so talking about the technologies so every step of your supply chain you have a different technologies which can help you in reducing the food loss so like when you are talking about the harvesting harvesting at the right time and using a, a simple machinery which would cause a less damage or uh, bruises into your produce that will reduce your losses talking about the pre cooling especially in the perishables so this is a procedure where you remove the field heat the heat which is carried out by fruit or a vegetable or any perishable so when you are to the next step of your supply chain so this is a process by which you remove the field heat so you can see a picture over there on the right side so the portable forced air cooling tunnel is a small scale structure so where you have a fan which is connected like a which pulls out all the air and uh, it's a forced air is the principle where the produce is cooled or the heat from the produce is removed so by this by doing this again you are going to reduce a significant amount of losses so talking about the pack house operations again doing the sorting grading of course this is a most neglected one in some of in some of the conditions these are the most neglected one but yeah even the sorting and grading do have their effect in reducing the losses not only that the washing and how do you trim or how do you pack and all the things they're going to have a significant effect on reducing your losses so there are different technologies again in the pack house operation then coming to the processing is the most interesting way of reducing the losses here not only the losses are reduced but also you are adding a value to your produce you can see a wonderful picture over there where the small scale way the tomatoes are being dried so the solar dried rather you're not using any other uh, non renewable resources you have your solar dried tomatoes and they go you're adding a value it can be stored for a longer period of time and you're also increasing the availability of that certain fruit or vegetable so processing is also one of the way to reduce your losses the next comes your storage transport or storage and distribution this storage and distribution have uh, majority of the losses do happen at this stage especially when you are not having a proper storage structure or when you are not maintaining when you are having a temperature abuse so even too low temperatures or too high temperatures if you are not managing the temperature properly if you are not managing the humidity properly that's going to cause a huge amount of losses so having a proper storage structure you can reduce your losses transportation to having a proper transport vehicle and even the transport uh, the connectivity so you are going to reduce a huge amount of losses uh in case of some of the perishables sometimes it might require a temperature control transportation not reduce the losses again 
so you use it according to the the way like whatever returns you are going to get back so majority of the points so the discussion is still here about the distribution but that doesn't stop over there the supply chain even continues as a household even the household by using it right temperature keeping the fruit at the right temperature like some for example so you have a mango so mangoes don't like a too cool temperature you are keeping in a refrigerator the top rack near to the freezer so you think that you are keeping in the refrigerator and you expect it to stay for a longer period and you think that you are doing a good to the mango but mango is not the fruit which would like a very low temperature so knowing that thing a small petty things of course but even they do contribute in reducing the losses so here i have listed out all the different ways or all the different steps of your supply chain where interventions can be like uh, they can be included so that you can reduce the losses so there are still a lot of long list of things where at every stage again in order to reduce the losses so we know how to reduce the losses we already have a lot of literature how to reduce the losses so what comes next so we know the knowledge. we know how to reduce the losses and we have a knowledge but when it's not passed to the person at every point of your supply chain that doesn't make any sense so having a lot of literature is not going to make any sense the ultimate thing is it has to reach the person or it has to reach the stakeholder who is going to implement it so there comes your capacity building or extension so capacity building programs usually they create a, like in specific about the post harvest a capacity building pro, capacity building program they create a cadre of well trained pro, post harvest professionals and then by this way they will be training uh, again the trainers will be training other trainers or the locals or even uh, the residents or whatever so here the capacity building program is a way you can just transfer your knowledge from the point of innovation to the point of implementation so that's the one of the most important thing not only the innovation but also transferring the knowledge from point of innovation to point of implementation also matters so in order to reduce these losses effective extension and training program about not only the factors which are causing these losses but also the ways to reduce these losses is also essential so first the people should know what exactly are causing the losses like for example i can just get, share you a story like um, i was having a field visit in a, a park called as rajasthan in india so they are traditionally they were using a bamboo basket and uh, they were using this bamboo basket for almost all the vegetables all the fruits so they were using this thing for tomatoes too tomatoes and they were harvesting at a very right stage so they were assuming that okay there is a container and it's uh, doing a good but to a point that's not their suitable packing material or the thing which you use for tomatoes you might need to use something else which would have a better cushion and which would not cause a huge impact on your tomatoes maybe it's good for another fruit but not for the tomatoes so over here so yeah they are traditionally following something they need to know that this is this is the thing which is going to cause the loss so then they can have another innovation or implementation of something else which is new so reducing the losses is possible only by effective extension and training and transferring the technology from the point of innovation to the point of implementation so but unfortunately or uh, the proper transfer of knowledge is still lacking in uh, majority of the parts and especially in the low and middle income nations there is still a gap between the research centers and the implementation places so how do we do this so capacity building again you have a different way like uh, there are different outreach methods so it can be as simple as uh, like a uh, you know, the people gathering you just in uh, usually okay we'll just go with the list and they just go with the uh, case study or example so the first and most easiest way and most effective way is education institutions so by including the topics in the curriculum it may be a graduate or the school or high school so that's the best way you educate a huge amount of a population in a, a short period in a local area or a small area so by including these in the curriculum in the education institutions that's the one of the best ways of the capacity building the next one is your location specific or a crop specific project so again we will discuss about this when we have a discussion question so every again uh, when you are talking about the capacity building program so one program which was successful in certain area may not be successful in other area so that may be because of economic reasons social causes or cost or whatever 
So every specific location might have a certain requirement of a certain uh, innovation, or else it may be a certain capacity building method. So having a location specific and crop specific project. So these are also really a good ways to increase your or capacity building. And then the most interesting and the best way is again uh, information communication technologies. This is uh, in the recent times, especially following the COVID. This has got really a very big push. And uh, there are a lot of information, especially even uh, regarding the COVID uh, awareness, a lot of videos were made. In the same way, there are many organizations which are coming up also making a video, how to handle your produce, the post harvest, like uh, one of the best example is the organization named as a Sobo. So they make uh, animated videos and uh, they just uh, add up, like they make a video and they have a uh, uh, voiceover in different languages and different accents and they just transfer it for the free. Like everybody can access these videos for free and they have a very informative videos regarding the post harvest handling and whatsoever. And they do have a very good impact. And so this is one of the, again, the best way of your capacity building. The next thing is your e-learning programs and online events. Online events and e-learning programs, they do save a lot of money. And uh, it's the best way to reach a people of almost every corner of the world. So these days, internet is almost there in majority of the past. So by these programs, you save a lot of money because the transportation and all the traveling and all the things is reduced. And you're also transferring your information in an effective way. So whatever the, the simple single time, you're transferring to different parts of the world. The conferences and the public interaction events, these are also one of the good way of networking and also the capacity building. And the uh, next one is your public-private partnership. Again, it's also an interesting way of capacity building. So when the private organizations in get involved with your public organizations or the government, and they come up with some intervention or they just make any capacity building programs, the training programs. So relatively, when it is only a public program, it means about a government program and they, something which is a public and private partnership. So the influence or uh, the effect was relatively more or the good effort, good uh, results were more in public-private partnerships. So again, this is also a really very good way of capacity building and also to reduce the post harvest loss or this is a very good outreach method. So I've just listed out over here the different methods of outreach. So yeah, another thing is, yeah, as I told you, the outreach methods can be as simple as word of mouth communication or it can be of uh, written materials or field visits or e-learning programs or even the ICTs or information technology as it as I've said. So, but the, again, the question comes is identifying a suitable capacity building method. Same like your post service technology. So some technology may be good at certain region, but it may not be at good at other region. So you need to identify whether the technology is going to be good at the region or not, and then implement it. The same way the capacity building methods. So some of the capacity building methods may be suitable for one region, but may not be suitable for other region. So identifying a suitable capacity building method and designing an effective training program, it is really a big deal. And for this, you need to have a complete understanding of different aspects of what exactly your target issue is. So these are the, these are the things which I wanted to discuss. I have discussed briefly about what are the different post harvest technologies or techniques which you have, which are available. And then I've also discussed about what is the importance of the capacity building or what is the importance of moving your technology from point of innovation to the point of uh, implementation. So I have uh, two questions for you all audience. So the first question is related to the first part about the post harvest technology. So that's what, as I told you, so there are many evidences where certain technology was successful in a particular area. So the same technology when it was tried when it was tried to implement in southern southern area, so it may not be successful. So what do you think? What makes certain technology successful for a specific location, or uh, how do you identify a certain technology is suitable for a specific location or not? So yep, if anybody wants to give an answer, please go ahead. Yeah, this is the time to use your raise the hand button there. Yes, if you click participants at the bottom of your screen, 
you'll see a list of everybody who's participating. And then you'll also see a button at the bottom that says raise hand. Go ahead, James. Yep. Hi. Yeah, hi. I think the main thing that I've run into is looking at um, the infrastructure capacities of the location, um, especially when we're thinking about large energy expenditures. Um, so low tech and um, like farm hack ways of adapting technologies to be, I guess, suited for the for the infrastructure of the place. Okay, so maybe I can just uh, say that energy usage, we need to keep in mind how much energy is going to use or uh, how is the energy availability like, uh, yes, as exactly said. So there are a lot of infrastructure already available, especially for the storage maybe. So there are a lot of options, but when it's the main com point comes out to be is energy usage. So it might use a good amount of energy it may be electric energy or whatsoever, but the source of an, uh, electricity may not be really a reliable one. So then comes into your point, the low tech or uh, the small scale or the one which uses uh, renewable or it may be a solar powered or some other renewable or renewable powered infrastructure. Yes, any other things? So what do you think? How do you identify a certain technology suitable for specific location? Yep, we have two more hands. Yeah, Jonathan, go ahead and unmute. Uh, I think one of the things that you need to look at when you are deciding should be the type of crop. Uh, when you want to identify the certain technology suitable for the location, I think a type of crop uh, should come in, in uh, should be a decision maker. Okay, so the produce specific technology. So, yep, exactly. So. Some of the technologies may be good for certain produce, and but for other produce, it may not be really a big deal. So again, when you're moving your certain technology from one area to other area, so certain produce may be a really a very widely produced in area one, but when you're moving to area two, that produce is not really a, a, a major one. It may be a minor one, and the technology may not be really successful for that. Yep. I think we have one more hand. Yeah, David, go ahead. Yeah, from my experience, um, I would determine in part uh, by watching what the local people do and how they store things, especially in a small scale. My first year in Cambodia, I did not have a refrigerator. So the Cambodians helped me know how to store fresh limes by putting it in a pile of sand um, outside my house. So we stored fresh limes in sand. Uh, which made them last longer, obviously, because of the coolness of the sand. So um, as I walked around and continued to live in Cambodia, I know many people stored, um, you know, without electricity, uh, stored their fresh limes in sand. Uh, a concern I have, and, and I'm wondering if other people have examples like that uh, from around the world that are more low scale as opposed to, um, you know, higher production scale with businesses and so forth, which are also very important. Thank you. Yep, that's really very interesting experience. Yeah, and yeah, and that's one more thing. First thing is, it's not that when we are innovating now, only then people are knowing it. We traditionally, there are a lot of technologies already there. Maybe we need to upscale them. So even that's really a good option. So yeah, similar one, the pot in pot technology. So you have a pot, a bigger one, you fill it with the sand and you have a smaller pot kept inside, you, you keep your vegetables or fruit. And you have, there was a paper published and they say that there's a difference of, in the tropical areas, there's a difference of almost seven to eight degrees Celsius from inside that inner pot and outside environment. So it's like a, a mini refrigerator, you, it's a, serving the purpose over there, at least in a small scale. And there are quite a good number of technologies like that, like uh, especially the evaporative cooling principle. There are a lot of technologies. That's really a very good experience. Thanks for sharing. Yep. And uh, yeah, any, any more or shall I move to the, I have one more question and I think I'm running short of the time. Yeah, I think the James has another comment. I was just gonna tag on that by saying, um, we're thinking of it on the post harvest side, but I know that seed storage is also um, in, in the more developed world, 
uses refrigeration technologies to keep a uh, more stable supply of seeds. But um, there are similar to the lime example, um, examples of people using ash to store their seeds. Um, and yeah, just, just thinking about that portion of the security. Yep, so yeah, that's exactly right. So that's what I was, uh, even I have a few experiences where the indigenous technologies, they really are worth serving the purpose in that area. And maybe we need to identify those and we can just upscale it so that we can just also ensure the food security, food safety rather. Like maybe when you are using ash or a sand or sometimes it might cause a food safety issue. So maybe we can just first identify the things which are already there. And when we are upscaling it, I think people will be more easy on ready to accept it rather than just introducing a new, just dumping a new technology with full of machines and maybe they may not be really very happy to access it. So yeah, and I have one more question. Maybe we'll quickly wrap it up. So this is about the capacity building method. So again, there are different outreach methods uh, which are there, like I just listed out, like it may be a curriculum or it may be a word of mouth or it can be a different way. So how do you think, will you choose your outreach method? Like if you have to go to an area and you need to do a training program or you need to just uh, do a capacity building any program, how do you choose your outreach method? So what would be the factors you would consider? And maybe if we are running short of a time, maybe we'll just go with the last question. Which outreach method was most effective in your experience or in your local area? And why was it a successful? Yeah, please. Yeah, great question. Any takers? Okay, go ahead, Jonathan. I think one of the factors that would help you uh, consider the methods for capacity 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 building is the location. Uh, how is the location? If, for example, you want to use ICT and the location is not, uh, cannot be able to access ICT, then that becomes an issue. Uh, if you want maybe to go the way of uh, probably educational and uh, there are no schools in that area, that is also an issue, like partnership with schools where there are no schools uh, is impossible. I think that's my take on that question. Then which outreach method is most effective in my location? Uh, which is Kenya, and one of the places is the rural areas, I can say, is a partnership with the schools. That has been effective. Uh, the reason is uh, one of the things that uh, I have come to realize is that generation, once they get the concept of how to deal with the crops, it's easy and it's also fun to them. So it makes it work uh, easier for the community. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. So, any more? Any more experiences? Okay, so I have also seen that sometimes social factors do matter a lot when you are choosing your capacity building program. So like for example, in some of the communities, maybe women are not really very free or they are not comfortable having a training programs along with all the group. Or sometimes there are even some restrictions for the technologies too. When you're talking to the very remote areas or rural areas, maybe the women may not have an access to some of the technologies too. So yeah, in that case, you might need to check out some, not every time ICTs are going to work out. So you also need to check out or consider all the different type of uh, the outreach methods. And depending upon the considering, considering that area, and especially again, even the cost, cost factor, the social factors and even the environment and financial, all the factors, you might choose your capacity building method. And uh, outreach method, which was effective in my experience was of course ICTs in the videos. So people are more interested when uh, you make an animated videos and uh, when you're having an attire of their local, like a local attire, not uh, something which is foreign to them. But if you are making an animated videos with the local attires and if you have, uh, if you're putting a voice with a local accent, so they get more attracted. So rather than having something which is out of their context, if you have something which is more common for them, which is which they are hearing it daily, so that was more effective for them and they accepted that thing. And it was also now these days, it was also popularized or it was also distributed more frequently. So that's what I feel. So ICTs, especially the videos were really very effective in my experience. 
and again the videos which were made animated videos if it was possible or even the other normal videos if they are with the local accent and the local attire that was really more uh, effective in certain area that's my experiences so if you have some time maybe we can anybody else can share their experiences yeah anyone else can share their experiences and we also have one question um Yep. Robert asks about molds and aflatoxins. They seem to be at risk at all stages from fruiting on the plant to storage over the short and long term. How do we ensure long term non toxic prote protection from mold and aflatoxins? So, okay, to be frank, we, it's a bit out of my presentation, I suppose. Uh, yeah, we do have already a uh, sort of a technology, there's even the storage technologies where you are just managing your moisture content and uh, temperature too so we're reducing your after mm -hmm. that's what the, my answer at this stage and if anybody can answer in a better way yeah please yeah i know that uh, i think usaid had uh, worked in conjunction with some university to create some mold cards that we distributed at a conference to years ago that would just the uh, colored paper would turn a different color based off the uh, humidity in the air and would kind of give you an indicator of whether a seed was safe for storage. So um, there's lots of small low tech solutions like that uh, that are available, which are great. And then Robert wanted to also know what is the name of the organization producing the free videos animations on post harvest and is there a website? Yeah, it is a Sabo. I am just typing it in the chat. So okay. yes, they do S A W B O. So you can just mm -hmm. go through it, and uh, you can just Google the Sabo, and you'll have the first thing which pops out is uh, the website, and you can just browse through a range of uh, the free animated videos. And uh, you also have an option of choosing your own accent, like if it is an English, an Indian English, American English, or whatever. You have that option. Yep. Great. Okay, well, we've got about five minutes left in our time together. Um, let's just go ahead and open the floor for questions. Feel free to either raise your virtual hand or type out a question. Any other questions for VJ and post harvest? Or maybe you can just share your experience regarding your capacity building way or your post harvest technology too. Yeah, that would be great. So like we got an interesting yeah. story in the Cambodia where the lions were stored in the sand and the seeds stored in the ashes. Yeah, James Havenel. Sorry to talk so much, but you know, <laughs> um, I I found so many extension events to be extremely boring, and the ones that make a big difference um, are ones that are interactive. So making sure that you're not just talking to your audience, but all of these things that we're talking about are really practical, movement-based um, work, and so really getting people to move and not just um, get bored. <laughs> it's nice and it's also a better way to build community and connect with people because you're able to um, show kind of who they are and who you are in relation to each other. Thank you. So any more questions? Uh, Q and A here. Um, Richard asks, "What are some positive results you have observed through your capacity building?" What are the positive results? So, okay, I will just share an experience of our own organization. So, we do provide a training programs and uh, in a different ways of a capacity building, uh, like a training in person. And our most successful way was e-learning program. So we offer a free learning program and uh, it's upon the pace of the participant. We have, a, it has a set of 11 assignments and I am also, I did the same program in 2012. I was a student. Now I am joining the board and uh, I'm just in the organization. So through e-learning program, we could reach almost 34 participants of 34 different countries. And there were almost 180 who are trained. And these trainers again trained a huge amount of population. It was in a geometry proportion. And today we have a wonderful network, like we have uh, an issue in certain, so for example, it's in Nigeria, we have 
so uh, we need a resource or we need a participant or we have something which we want to know and we have a very good network now so e learning program was one of the successful way and uh, the the results of speaking about the results yeah we have a huge amount of people who got trained through our e learners and uh, the best way is we got a very wonderful network so because we regularly when we having e learning program we have a place where we regularly interact and we have a list of people who have participated and who have completed this e learning program so we have a people from a different parts and we know uh, so for example if it is uh, so niger so we have a list of people who pass or who did this e learning program and we can just approach them if there is any project in niger and if we have we want any resource from niger and we know that they have already trained in the post harvest part so we can just communicate them we can drop an email we have an information coming to that so in my experience through our organization e learning program was successful for our organize whatever the organization motto we had we got a very good network not only that we could train a multiple people through our this program and it was uh, an online so literally it didn't take a huge amount of money to bring everyone at one place or whatever of course we do gather whenever it's possible but yeah it saved a lot of money but still we could train a lot of people and it uh, it has literally spread almost 34 different countries and we have a very good network of always people coming from 34 different countries maybe that's one of the success story we have from our organization that's great okay well it's 11:45 folks so we're going to give you the 10 minute break as promised if you have more questions or would like to continue the conversation i would encourage you to uh, join the community board on hoova and post your comments there you'll find a, a, a board that is titled uh, with vj and post harvest management continue the conversation and uh, otherwise we'll see you guys in 10 minutes for dr colverson's talk thanks so much vj for your time and we appreciate you love the photo okay thank you very much chris and thank you very much uh, thank you very much for everyone and uh, thanks for sharing your stories too thank you <laughs>